Howdy y'all, and welcome back to the Texian channel. This is episode 5, The Zimmerman Telegram. I'm fascinated by the First World War. I came across it when I was an undergraduate. I kind of studied it from the Irish perspective at the time, because that was kind of the class I was in, but I've always found it an amazing pivot point in history. The world changed with that war, fundamentally. Peter Hitchens, the British commentator, said that the First World War was the dawn of the modern age. That was the event that brought about the modern age. It was a catastrophe. It was awful for everybody involved. A nightmare that they sort of stumbled into and then couldn't find their way out of for the longest time. It represented the death of the old world, the old order, which admittedly had been struggling for a long time to hang on. But this killed it off and ushered in a modern age. And quite honestly, ushered in the American century and launched the United States as a superpower. And it's that part of it the involvement of the United States in World War I that I want to talk about in this video. The Zimmerman telegram was a telegram that was sent from the German Foreign Office by a man named Zimmerman to a colleague, a counterpart, in Mexico City. We'll talk a little bit later about what was actually in the telegram. But when it was intercepted, and when it was made known to the American government, it set off a wildfire. It kind of touched a light to a stack of kindling that was drenched in gasoline. It got America into the war. Well, that and unrestricted submarine warfare, but we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. But the Zimmerman telegram, it put it over the top. And my own belief is that the Zimmerman telegram should never, ever have done that. I'm of the opinion, and again, I recognize this might be a bit controversial, I'm of the opinion that the United States should not have intervened in the First World War in any way. That the money we loaned to Great Britain and France to fight it prolonged it. And that we really had no business going over there and sending our young men over there to die in a European conflict that, quite frankly, didn't really affect the United States at all. But we did get into it. I'm going to make a case for why that was. I welcome you to agree with it or disagree with it, as always. We have to put the spring of 1917 into a little bit of perspective. Two and a half years, three years into the war at this point, and Germany is growing desperate. The British had been blockading them for years, that had strangled the economy and the war effort. They were struggling to find the supplies they needed. The citizens were out in the streets angry, wanting bread, wanting medicine. Unrest was rife. There were strikes. People were growing weary of the war and the hardship it was bringing. They wanted it over. The German high command knew it. Germany couldn't make it much longer. They needed to bring that war to a successful conclusion quickly. Everything that they had tried before had been unsuccessful. However, they had also fought off all the British attempts and the French attempts too. But there was hope. There was reason to believe it could be done. The Russians, who the Germans were fighting on the Eastern Front, weren't long for the war. And everybody knew it. The Tsarist regime was crumbling in late 1916. In fact, it fell in March of 1917. And Russia was out of the war that same year. The German high command knew it. The Russians weren't long for it. And if they could get the troops from the Eastern Front over to the West, they may be able, with that extra manpower, 
to knock out, or at least have a significant enough victory on the Western Front to bring the British and the French to the negotiation table. Probably didn't have a lot of hopes of actually winning the war outright. But it may have been enough to convince the British and the French not to fight on. But it wouldn't have been enough on its own. Or at least they couldn't assume that it would have been. They needed to put up the pressure on the British in their own homes, as they had done through their blockade. Those two blows, if struck simultaneously in 1917, could do the trick. If they could shut off the supplies coming from North America to Britain, starve the people or get them closer to starvation, deprive them of the supplies they needed to fight the war, lower their morale, and have a significant victory on the Western Front, it might have been enough to convince the British and the French to come to the table. And Germany would have been at that table and negotiating from a position of strength. But they didn't have long to do it. Time was short. So what did they decide to do? They decided in the fall of 1916 that they were going to do something a little bit drastic in the early part of 1917. Again, they thought the Russians didn't have long to go. But they also knew that effectively squeezing Britain through a blockade and through sinking all the shipping would take time as well. It was a bit of a long game. 1917, they hoped, was going to be a very important year for them. So they made the decision to restart unrestricted submarine warfare. Unrestricted submarine warfare basically means that the submarines of, well, the U-boats of the German Navy would sink any ship of any flag anywhere, without warning. Now, they had done this earlier on in the war. The British actually had been playing some tricks, um, disguising um, guns aboard what you might call a transport vessel or what looked like an innocuous little transport ship. Convention at the time was that the submarine would surface, make its presence known, warn the captain of the ship that they were going to sink it, give them time to abandon ship, or potentially even bring them on board the submarine. And once they were safely away from the boat itself, it would be sunk. So what were the British doing? Well, the submarine would surface, go up to that ship that they thought was a harmless merchant vessel, and suddenly the British would open fire on it and sink the submarine. The Germans said, okay, well, if you're going to do that, we're going to start sinking you no matter what. And they did that earlier on in the war. And in fact, the Lusitania was sunk in 1915 with a massive loss of American life because of unrestricted submarine warfare. But we had demanded that they stop it, the United States, that is, and they had. They stopped it, mainly because they didn't want to bring us into the war. They were concerned about that. And in 1915, yeah, it didn't look all that desperate. It didn't look great for the Germans at that time, but it wasn't desperate yet either. They could afford to do that. As for us, the United States, we were still neutral, and we had resisted efforts to join for a whole host of reasons. Now, Wilson, President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, I'm not a big fan of his at all, for a whole host of reasons that I won't get into here. But he had run for re-election in 1916, promising not to get America into the war. Privately, based on what I have read, he was very keen to get us in because he saw it as the path to greater American influence, and the, really the only way he could get his 12 points in League of Nations ideas to happen. He had to be at the table whenever this war ended to be able to bring that about. Otherwise, it just would have been ignored. So he wanted to get in for that reason. For his part, the American banking industry wanted in too. Like I said earlier, it had been funding the slaughter for years. They'd been sending massive amounts of money to the British and the French. In fact, the British borrowed so much to fight the war, I don't think they finished paying off their World War I debt until 2014 or 15, something like that. It was over 100 years it took them to pay that off. The banking industry realized that if the Germans won, or even achieved a negotiated peace that was favorable to them, it jeopardized the banking industry getting their loans paid back. The Germans weren't going to pay those loans off for the British. And if the British were subjugated and lost some of their colonies, especially India, which they might have had to do 
if the Germans were victorious enough and were able to negotiate from enough of a place of strength, they may not see a cent of it back. Or at the very least, it was going to come back in vastly devalued currency. So the American banking industry wanted in, too. American industry wanted in. War is good for business. It means a lot of government contracts to make artillery shells and guns, uniforms, ships. War is really good for American business. They like it. Always have. The American people, on the other hand, well, they didn't really have any desire to get in. They didn't want to send their sons to die over in Europe. The newspapers at the time were rife with stories of death. We talked about 1914. We talked about what happened at the Somme in my last video about Chamberlain. It was terrible what was happening, and they saw that. And Europe at the time might as well have been on the other side of the universe. Most American people were poor farmers. Maybe not poor, but they were farmers. They were rural. We were a very rural agricultural country at the time. You needed your son on the farm to help you with the farm work. And the idea that we would send him off to go die in France because the Europeans had some sort of spat, well, that didn't really <laughs> appeal to a lot of Americans. Further to that, a lot of Americans at the time were Irish or German in their descent, in their heritage, and they didn't have any particular love for the British or their cause. The Irish especially. Go knock on their door and tell them to go over and fight for the British, and you, you might get told something in return, and it would be slightly more than no. So because of that, Wilson had to say he was against it, or he certainly would have been defeated in the 1916 election. He was running against a man named Hughes, who was a politician from New York. He was the favorite to win. In fact, Wilson's win in 1916 was kind of an upset. They didn't expect it. He had benefited from a split election in 1912 where the Republicans had kind of split their own vote. And Wilson got in. He wasn't an especially popular president. He wasn't horribly dispopular either, but he didn't have some huge ground swell of support. His hold on power was tenuous. And certainly he had the banking industry and other industries telling him that war would be a good thing to try to get him in. He had to weigh that too as he was facing re-election. We were steadfast. We refused to go time and time again. We talked about the fact that they were sinking American ships. They sank the Lusitania. But I think the general sentiment amongst a lot of people in America at the time was, hey, there was a war going on. You knew there was a war going on, and you still sailed over there. You made your decision. You took the risk. You knew it was a risk, and you did it. You did it for your own profit. I'm not going to send my kid to die for that. I'm not going to send my kid to die because you took this risk. Would that we had that mindset today. The world might be a better place. So the Germans decide to gamble. They decide to gamble. Time's short. The Russians are going to get out soon in all likelihood. They need to win in 1917. They got to push their chips to the center of the table. This is where the Zimmerman telegram comes in. Now the text of the Zimmerman telegram is out there. You can read it online. Uh, but basically, it authorized the German ambassador in Mexico City to give or to offer an alliance to Mexico if the United States entered the war as a result of unrestricted submarine warfare starting again. The Germans basically said, we're going to try to do this in a way that doesn't bring the U.S. into the war. We're going to try, but if the U.S. does come into the war, then you're authorized to go to the Mexican government and say, join us. Join us in the fight. It promised support. It promised that um, any negotiated peace at the end of the war would have to include this U.S. Southwest going back to Mexico, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and California. Any peace deal would have to include that land getting returned. Land that they had sold to the United States, and they really didn't have a choice to sell it. We were occupying the capital, but <laughs> we were occupying Mexico City, but nonetheless, they sold that land to us. 
after the Mexican-American War in the mid-1800s. But they hadn't forgotten that, and they still considered it theirs, and I think the Germans thought that that would be a pretty good incentive. So here's what happened. The British intercepted that message, which was sent on an American and Swedish diplomatic cable that the British were not supposed to have tapped. Again, we were neutral. We allowed the Germans to use it because we wanted to keep good relations with them as a neutral country. We weren't at war with them. They asked for permission, and we said yes, out of diplomatic nicety, I guess you could say. So the British were in a bit of a quandary. They had this telegram. They had intercepted it illegally. They had deciphered it. They knew what it said. They knew how it could be used to bring the Americans into the war, which is something that the British had been hoping for for quite some time. But they also knew that they'd come by it in the wrong way. And if they just walked over and handed it to the Americans, the Americans might start asking some uncomfortable questions. So they sat on it until they could figure out what to do. And they decided to come up with a ruse where they made it seem like they had actually bought the message in Mexico. We didn't tap it. They made it through, and that's how we got it. Mm -hmm. Now, whether the leadership of the United States bought it, bought that story, I don't know. And it's kind of irrelevant. Personally, I think there was a lot of skepticism of it. I think they knew exactly what had happened, but they weren't willing to come out and say it. Because again, there was a lot of people in our government that wanted into the war, and they weren't going to rock the boat. They recognized what a boon this was to them in that effort. That and the submarine warfare was what they needed to get in, so they weren't going to ask questions. So when it was turned over to the U.S. ambassador, he instantly recognized the value of it. And the U.S. government and the media propagandized the hell out of it. Cartoons started popping up in U.S. papers, blowing the thing up as though it was the Germans encouraging the Mexicans to invade us. They weren't, of course. The text of the telegram's clear on that. The only way that alliance was going to happen is if the U.S. joined the war on our own. We jumped in. Then Mexico was to be offered the alliance. They didn't send it directly to the Mexicans. Again, they sent it to the German ambassador there in Mexico City. But the propaganda worked. Edwin Bernays would be proud. The propaganda worked. And many Americans began to flip their view. They were outraged. They were made to be outraged. And the unrestricted submarine warfare started in the early spring of 1917. And those two things put together got America in the war that April. We joined. We lost 116,000 men in the fighting. And during our time in the conflict, we had the highest casualty rate of any combatant. Kind of makes sense. The British and the French didn't have much left to give. Neither did the Germans. Our guys went over there and did a lot of the heavy lifting in 1917 and 1918. 116,000 men didn't come home. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I don't think the United States should have intervened. I don't think we should have gotten involved in the First World War. And frankly, I think if U.S. leadership had been better, we wouldn't have. Because this Zimmerman telegram should have been looked at as an absolute joke. It should have been looked at as comical. Uh, type of thing that you would deliver as a punchline at a party. There was no way the Mexicans would ever have agreed to it, for a number of reasons, and I'm not really breaking any new ground here. I mean, this is very well known. The Mexicans could never win a war with us. They knew it, and so did we. Now, they didn't like us very much. <laughs> there was plenty of animosity for a whole host of reasons. But their military looked at it and recognized that the United States was simply too powerful. Mexico could never win the war. So they probably would never have gotten in in the first place. They were in a civil war, Mexico was at the time. The country was divided. Part of the reason they hate us, or hated us at the time was because we intervened in 1914 and installed a, a government in Mexico. And there were people in the outskirts of the country who didn't like that government and were resisting it. 
Now, sometimes war efforts can bring countries together, but the idea that suddenly this deeply unpopular government was going to rally all of these rebels in the countryside to join the cause and not take advantage of a distracted Mexican military to topple the government in Mexico City was laughable. They weren't going to do that. Had their hands full with that. Further, the offer of assistance would have been dubious at best. Germans were broke and everybody knew it. And besides, the British had strangled them to the point that no ships could have gotten through with guns or materiel. The only way they could have brought them was by submarine. And, you know, World War I submarine, you couldn't have loaded it up with too many guns or ammunition or anything like that. There would have been no assistance in all likelihood. They would have had to take us on on their own. And the Mexican government would have known that the United States would never have allowed a treaty sending the Southwest back to be signed. We never would have signed it. We would have carried on the war ourselves if we had to. We weren't going to allow that land to go back to Mexico. Not under any circumstances. And the Mexicans knew that. The carrot was unachievable. And even if they did achieve it, even if somehow they did get that land back, what would they have gotten? They'd have gotten a bunch of white, English-speaking, heavily armed citizens who had absolutely no desire whatsoever to be a part of Mexico. And they would have had to go up there and try to administer government to them. How would that have worked? I've lived in Texas my whole life. And Texas has changed a lot since 1917, of course, but even today, that would not be a very popular thing. It certainly wouldn't have been popular back then either. The Mexican government was smart enough to know that. Not only was the carrot not achievable, they probably didn't even want it. It wasn't going to do them much good. It'd be a lot more trouble than it was worth. So what should have happened? Well, this is what I think should have happened. This is what I think a responsible political leadership would have done. If you disagree, again, comment, let me know. But this is what I think. I think the minute that, that telegram was shown to the leadership of the United States, we should have wired the Germans and politely told them that they needed a new foreign minister. That he had just cooked up, quite possibly, one of the most ludicrous offers in the history of international relations. It was absolutely laughable. And not only that, he had done it in such a haphazard way that it had got intercepted, or bought, whatever they believed at the time, and that we had a hold of it. But we would have told them that, or should have told them, that the Zimmerman cat didn't know what he was doing. This was asinine. Now, the next thing I think he should have done was wired the British and asked them why on earth they were tapping our communications lines. Now, we probably knew the truth anyway. But, put some pressure on them. I think he should have demanded they remove them. It was wrong. They shouldn't have been tapped. We were a neutral country. What they did was a violation of international law. Now, we were closely supporting them, of course. But that was wrong, what they did. And I think the U.S. government's first responsibility is to look out for the U.S. citizens not the British in their war effort, and look out for our sovereignty. So I would have told them, get those taps off there. Don't ever do it again. And then I think you call the Mexican government and say, you know what, we know you had absolutely nothing to do with this, and we want to stay peaceful with you, such as it is. It's a tenuous peace, we know that. But we realize that this is a ridiculous offer that you would never accept, and we're not going to hold it against you. Let's work together to make sure that we can have peaceful relations. That's what I would have done. I genuinely think. And I think that's what a responsible government would have done too. But unfortunately, our government at the time wasn't responsible. They wanted into the war, for the reasons I talked about a few minutes ago. And they didn't care about the death. They knew what was going on in Europe. And they knew how horrible it was. And they were still happy to send our guys over there. And they were willing to send them over there, in part, because of this ridiculous telegram. I don't know what would have happened if that had happened. In other words, I don't know how things would have played out 
if we had refused to join the war in April of 1917. The world would have been different. But I think it might have been better. I think that if we hadn't joined at that point, thinking in the British government would have changed to say, there's probably nothing that's going to get the Americans in. Sank the Lusitania. They sank their ships back in 1915. They said, no, we're not going to join. The Germans restarted submarine warfare, started sinking their ships again. And then along comes this telegram where they're offering an alliance to, a, to basically their next door neighbor to invade them. And the Americans still saw through it and said no. And I think at that point, British leadership would have had to have said, maybe we need to seek a peace. Without the military support of the United States, we're just going to keep grinding out on the Western Front. And we don't really know, of course, in the spring of 1917, right? We don't really know what's going to happen when all those German troops from the East get over here. They hadn't gotten there yet. It was later that summer that they came. My own view, and again, it's just my view, I think there's a chance that the war would have ended a year early if we had said no, if we had been responsible, if we had looked at the Zimmerman telegram for what it was, a desperate move by a desperate government that had absolutely no chance of being successful and in truth really wasn't a threat to us in any way. That's my opinion. If you disagree, comment below, let me know why. I'd love to know what your thoughts are. I always enjoy the back and forth with you guys. Like this video if you thought it was great. If you think it's interesting, share it with a friend. And of course, if you're so inclined, please subscribe to the channel. I'd love to have you on board. It's always my pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for listening. And until later, God bless.